Hey guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to Carl Gould today, and he is amazing. He does tons of coaching, and he is here talking to us. Our title today is How to Make the Transition from Growing to Scaling, and there is a difference, so stay tuned. We're going to talk about that, but before we do, Carl, introduce yourself to people who don't know you already. Tell them a little bit about your business and what you do. Sure, sure. Thanks, Chantel. Thanks for having me on. So, Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Carl Gould. I'm from New Jersey, and um, I started my career uh, studying accounting and finance at the University of Delaware. Um, I had to leave school because of a leg injury and uh, got into landscaping, of all things. That was my first entrepreneurial venture when I was 18 years old. Uh, grew that business over the next seven years, sold it, started a construction company and real estate development firm. I uh, had that business for uh, 14, 12 years and sold that business and but started my coaching career back in 1990. Um, I went to a couple of personal development seminars, just loved the concept, d dove right into it. And all through the 90s, that was my side hustle. You know, I was a I was a coach um, all through the 90s for Ken Blanchard, situational leadership and Franklin Covey systems and Tony Robbins and NLP and DISC and you name it. And I was certified in it. And then I started the business that I have today, seven stage advisors in 2002. And so that's, and that I've been doing that ever since. So, um, I, I went from living my life in a 60 mile radius of my home to, you know, now having worked with companies in 68 countries or, you know, and currently in about a dozen countries. Wow. Well, if you guys haven't had a chance to listen to Carl speak, he's absolutely amazing. I flew him down and we did a leadership kind of seminar that everyone absolutely loved. And so he's really a phenomenal speaker. So if you're ever looking for a speaker, I really highly suggest him. But Thank let's you. talk a little bit about, first of all, what is <clears throat> the difference between growing and scaling? Right, because they, they get used interchangeably. Yes. And people say, oh, I'm going to grow, I'm going to scale. No, no, you're not doing, we're doing one or the other. Um, growing is just doing more of what, what you're already doing, right? And so certain businesses are more, are more adept at uh, growth than scaling. You know, you have a real estate business where you have, uh, you have a real estate agency. Um, that's more of a growth model you know, cause it's hard to scale Michael Jordan. You know, you get a great agent. You're like, oh my gosh, I wish I could just duplicate you of course. But you know, unfortunately we can't do that yet. You know, maybe there's someday, but, um, and then there's certain businesses that are more uh, designed for scale and, you know, and growing is, is um, implies that you're just doing more of what you're already doing. Scaling implies that there's a sense of streamlining automation and it's process driven. And not that it's not personality driven, but it's less personality driven and more metrics driven. Whereas a growing company will rely more on personality, creative problem solving, culture. It'll have those, it, those aspects will need to be in more, more in place prominently. Yeah. And I, I would say that for me, if I wanted to scale my real estate business and what I would do in that case is that I would franchise it and then have all of the systems that I Bingo. do now, and That's then right. I franchise it, and then I would be then scaling. If I just wanna grow my real estate business, I'm now adding another office, another location, now I'm growing. As soon as I move into the franchise field, now I'm in the scaling side of things. Would you agree? That's a great, that's a great example, because when, when, as soon as you franchise, it's now based on the guiding principles, but also the systems that everybody has to follow. So it's about the system. And if you can imagine uh, somebody sitting behind the seat of a car, it's we've all decided to drive the same car and we have, and our job is to drive the car. Whereas in the agency model, we are relying on people, you know, some people's more creative um, uh, management skills, uh, project management, um, you know, deal, deal creating skills. And there's, there's more flexibility there. There's not one that's better than the other, but they just are different. And you have to recognize that they're different and treat them differently. 
Yeah. So give us another analogy. So I just gave that one with the real estate. Give another a couple <clears throat> of analogies so people can really understand this concept of the difference between growing and scaling. Yeah. So here's a good example. So let's take mind body online so booking software. So going back to the beginning, um, you had a husband and wife team um, that owned a yoga studio. They were struggling to find a system to book their classes. They were growing but they still manually took the, 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 the call. They had some, you could email in, there were some systems, but then they automated it and they created this booking software for their yoga studio and they called it Mind Body Online. And um, so, um, so they, they were able to, they grew their business, but they scaled their booking, right? And so what happened was they were now, if, through an automated system, able to book people um, into their classes what started to happen was they, they grew their yoga business, but they, they sold it. But they were able to scale their software business because as a platform, they went out to yoga studios first, but now really any class-based, occupancy-based company, they can now service through their software. So they were able to s scale their technology because it was based on a similar platform. They can modify it, they can skin it differently, but that's a business that was scalable. Um, now we most associate scalable businesses with technology and, and specifically software, but that's not, that doesn't have to be the case. You know, an airline, if you were to, if you were to fly American airlines, depending on where you're flying, you're not always flying American. I mean, it says American on the plane, yes. but you're, if you're regional jets, that's a different company. That's an express regional company that's been licensed by American using their booking systems, using all of their various technologies and platforms. But that's how American scales. There's the American system that other companies can, can book on, that, that can work through in order to deliver the services. Yeah, and I just, I guess I didn't realize that till a couple of years ago, because I remember flying and I was thinking to myself, I was, I started really diving in and I was asking, cause it was like operated by, right? It has yeah. American airlines. But then if you look, it says operated by. Right. And then one day I just started asking, this is probably like, I don't know, several years ago, I started asking the stewardess all these questions about that, you know? So how does it work? Who, who pays your uh, health insurance when you want time off. And I just started asking all these different questions. It's very, very interesting yeah. how, that, how that works. Right. And they have to meet, they have to meet certain standards, but they might not work for the company. Right. You know, and then all the vendors and all the supply chain have to do the same. So what are the leadership requirements that you need when you want to go from growing to scaling? Right. So this is interesting because, um, you know, I wrote a book called The Seven Stages of, of Business Success. And the first three stages are your growth stages. And then you scale once you hit four and beyond. But there's that, we call it the miracle 1%, uh, meaning it's a miracle that you go from growing to scaling because it's not, it's, it's not just semantics. It, it is a cultural shift. But more importantly, it's a leadership shift. So when you are a growing company, you are very relationship-based. That's important, but it requires you to be influential and everybody has to be bought into the mission, vision, um, values, and purpose of the founder. This is the, still the founder's game in the early growth stages. And we have to attach ourselves to that. And we just have to, we have to believe in and have the back of the founder. Mm. When you start to scale, the, the company takes on a slightly different personality. You... It, be, it takes on a personality of its own, right? So in order to, for it to scale beyond the founder, it has to have guiding principles, systems. Um, uh, it has to have its why, its call, whatever its cause-based is. It has, to, um, it has to have enterprise level uh, operations. So one of the easiest ways I explain it is companies go from me to we to us. And when you launch your business, it's me, right? meaning me and a few of my employees, we're just running around doing everything. Then it's we, we're a team, we've got some things that we, our, our mission, vision, values, purpose uh, kind of is our glue, it, it, it brings us together, but we're still doing whatever it takes to get the job done. And we are mostly effective, we're not necessarily efficient, but we do get the job done. To, to scale, it's gotta be about us. 
It's got to be, it's no longer about what the founder wants. It's what the marketplace has told us we are, what was, you know, we've proven our concept, we've pivoted, you know, Intel started out as a memory company. They're a chip company now. The marketplace told them that you're a chip company, you're not a, a memory company. And so they had to adjust away from what the founders initially designed for the business and they scaled around that, right? Mm -hmm. So once you become a scalable company, you let, you let the numbers and the metrics lead. So for example, um, if you are, uh, so a metric we're very fond of is revenue per employee per year, right? And what that means is if you do a million dollars and you have 50 employees, each employee is worth $200,000. And if it gets much above that, we know we need to hire because we're stretching them thin. If it goes way below that, we're cutting staff because they're not as productive. Well, we start, we've gotten to the point where we're consistent enough in our operations. We know our clients, we know our pricing. We've worked through most of the kinks of the model that we can now, uh, we can now let the numbers drive our decisions. So we're metrics first and we rally around the metrics as a, as a leader, right? So, so we're more, we're, we more manage the processes as a scalable business where we are, and, and we have management and leadership. In the beginning, we're just leading people, get the job done, let's get across the finish line. But we add a layer in when we're a scalable company where we manage those processes and we lead from, from right above that. Mm. So let's talk about, <clears throat> let's say, I think people realize when they are a, business that's a tech company, that's easier to scale. A lot of times if you're a product company, that's easier to scale. Uh, I have a friend of mine who has a lands, not landscaping, a uh, roof, roofing business and it's uh -huh. business, but he's got really wonderful systems in place that kind of are just, you know, he's got some really great technology in place. And so he's like, I don't want to franchise, but I'm thinking about doing a joint venture where, you know, I, I give them leads. He's got a call center that, you know, about roofs, like, you know, bringing in leads. So how could he take that business without, have you seen any businesses that didn't franchise because obviously when you franchise, it's easy to go, okay, that's how we're gonna scale. But if yeah. you don't wanna franchise, have you seen any joint mentors work or anything else in that service industry being able to scale? Sure, sure. Well, um, one, one service industry that is scaling well is uh, based off of a cause-based uh, marketing program is, or based on a cause is 4ocean.com. You know, the guys that sell the bracelets in order to clean up a pound of trash off the beaches in the oceans, they've got, that's, a, that's become worldwide. They are scaling based on, that, on that, that guiding principle. But here, so here's a perfect example for your roofing contracting friend. He, he can grow his business, he can grow his company, but there's only one part of his business he can really scale right now, and that's the back of the house. That's what he's talking about. He wants to scale his marketing systems, his administrative systems, probably his financial systems, maybe even his HR systems. So what he's gonna do is he's going to license the back of the house if he wants, right? But he could actually license the entire company to others where they use his business system and they can even use his name. So he could license that, it doesn't have to be a franchise or he could just be, you know, I could be ABC Roofing of Hampton Roads powered by ABC roofing company systems. I, mm -hmm. you, he can be the Intel inside for other companies or he can even license the name. But they, so he, if, he, if he were to do that, um, then he could be scalable. But the, unless he either opens up other, um, uh, other branches, and this is what um, Starbucks did in the very beginning. Starbucks owns all of their own um, branches, but what they did in the beginning was they did strategic alliances. And for example, they did an alliance and a joint venture with Magic Johnson, the basketball player in Los Angeles. He launched a whole, um, a whole uh, a series of uh, stores and then Starbucks bought them back at some point, but they used joint, uh, joint venturing very successfully to scale early on to prove the concept and get a footprint. Panera Bread did the same thing. 
they franchised early on, but then they bought them all back once they found how successful their model was. Mm -hmm. So, so sometimes you can scale parts of your business, but not all of your business, you know? Mm -hmm. So, well, this, and that's really good because this whole idea, I've seen that over and over and I can't even think off the top of, obviously powered by Intel, everyone knows that one, but I've seen some <clears throat> others and I just can't think of it off the good examples Here, off the top of my head. Here's one more, one quick one is LASIK for the oh. optometric world. So one doctor creates LASIK. It's a, you can scale around your methodology or, mm -hmm. or, te or that system. That's still a service business. That's still, you know, you're an eye doctor, but you offer LASIK and you can scale around that process as well. So not just guiding principles, but around that, you know, that technique or that process. Bikram yoga, Montessori schools, another mm, way. Those are great examples. Yeah. So what kind of employees do you need to have? So if you go, look, you know, I'm tired of being you know, mom and pop shop. I've got, let's say someone's got three locations right now. They've got three locations and they are like, I might not have the right employees. So first of all, how do they know who are the employees they need? What are the characteristics they need if they're going to now go, yeah, you yeah. were great when we had three locations, but if we really want to scale this. Yeah. So you need somebody who's willing to surrender the me for the we first off, that's got to be in their DNA that no matter how good they are, they're still a team player. You know, they're still going to follow the team. They're still going to practice hard. Um, and so that's got to be in their DNA, but let me give you an example. So, uh, so again, we're talking scale. So I'll give you some metrics. When you hire somebody, the, their, you, uh, you, you hire to core values and you build accountability first and you build culture around the accountability measures. So, so accountability is our master. Our dashboard is our master, and we serve that. We serve our dashboard. And so when we hire somebody, they have to be at least a six out of 10 in each of our core values, knowing that or with the proviso that we can train them to eight or above. If they're not at least six and we can't coach them up to at least eight, we don't bring them on. They have to match what we want to do. And I know the, there's a whole theory you want a top grade and we want tens everywhere. You want, when you're scaling, you want eights. You want eight, you know, you can have tens, but you're going after eights. When you date a 10 or you hire a 10, you know what they think about all day long? Being a 10. Not about the team, but being a 10. What that means is if you have an intent as an employee, you know what they're always doing? They're always wondering, am I being respected around here? Am I getting enough money? Do I have the right seat? And they're, and they're the ones that are on LinkedIn all the time, you know, answering, yes, I'll listen to any offer. Right. You want an eight. You know why? Because you know what an eight does? An eight aspires to be a 10. They work their tail off. They want to impress their bosses. And they are grateful for the job they have. And they will run through a wall. Now, I'll give you a perfect example. I was teaching at Texas Christian University, TCU, with their, uh, and, and their MBA program. And once a year, they do a CEO lunch. And the second in command at Nike is a TCU grad. And he, um, and he runs their whole Asia operation. He uh, handles Michael Jordan's business. He's their guy. Phil Knight said to him, he said, look, I'm, I could make you CEO. I'm not going to do it. You're too important to me uh, running uh, the business lines that you are. I'm going to take care of you, but you're not going to be CEO. Here's what he said to us. And I thought, this still sticks with me. He says to me, um, he said, 10 years ago, the phone stopped ringing. And we, none of us knew what, what he meant. And he said, he goes, the word on the street, everyone knows now, I'm a Nike guy. I bleed Nike. Don't even bother calling me. I'm not interested. I'm not going anywhere. I've been here. He's been there like 30 years. He's in his early 50s. He got his job. He got a job in his early 20s. Nike's what he's known most of his life. He goes, don't even bother calling me or offering. I'll tell you right now, I'm not interested. That's a guy that was an eight, and he's now an 11 in the system. And he's a rock star, and he's fully bought in to all of the metrics and what it's, what it's about. So you need people like that. And if you read the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, he talks about level five leadership. Right? A level five leader is not the charismatic out there, get it happen, make it happen kind of person. This is the person that puts the company first, 
doesn't need to be anywhere, doesn't need any of the press, doesn't want any of it, stands behind the scenes, knows every part of the business, and advocates for the business system and the business first before themselves or anything else. So you're, you're, who you grow with, you will likely only bring one third of that team to when you start to scale. Mm, yeah, I love that. So <clears throat> the next question I have is how can you do a hybrid of kind of a scaling method and having just growing your own stores? And I'll give you an example of one that mm -hmm. I know. So there's this company called The Weekly Juicery. And so she has four locations in Lexington, Kentucky, and they have organic juice and it's great. I can put the link in the, you know, the notes of how they do their juices. But what I love is a lot of times you go to these juice places and it's just nothing but fruit. They don't have a lot of, you know, greens. And these are like really high green juices. So what she decided to do is make it where they ship them to you. So she's still got her four locations, but now Good example. she keeps those running, but she's kind of got one location where she gives it to the four locations. Those are still running. They're still profitable, but where she's really scaling is she now can ship these juices anywhere across the country. She can overnight them. You get this amazing juice. She has a process that keeps the juice good for, for quite a while without, you know, harming the juice. And now she's scaled it. Um, right. Have you seen any other examples like that where you've seen yeah. they've been able to do that or even in the service industry business where they've been able to do something along those lines? Yeah. So you, when you have a hybrid, you find the part of your business that you can scale. As a matter of fact, there's an expression in the franchising world that any business can franchise, but not every business should. And um, because almost always you have to scale down part of the operations because the scalable part of your business, like a franchise, you need to be able to train somebody on it within in 90 days or less, just as a general rule of thumb. But um, a, a good example would be, uh, there's a company in England, uh, one of our clients called The Old Station Nursery. 13 locations, Sarah Steele is the founder, and she's created the Sarah Steele method of running a daycare center. She runs her 13. She can grow that. But she, she has licensed her Sarah Steele method to other schools in India, South Africa, um, Australia. And she launches schools that have their own name, but they use her system. Mm -hmm. uh, Intel is a great example. They have scaled. They, uh, they've taken that part of their business and scaled the chip side of their business. Um, the, um, uh, what would be another good example? Um, okay. There's a... Um, uh, there's a company that we worked with. Uh, they are a law firm and uh, they're a law firm. And what they've done is they have, um, they provide back of the house administrative services to other law firms because they do that part so well. Um, so they, they try their own cases and they manage their own clients, but their back office systems are so good. They, they actually handle that for other companies. So um, you, Either, uh, so uh, sales rep businesses are very good too, a good example, because they, are, they might be very good at selling their own product, but so they're so proficient at selling, they'll also rep other products. So typically a company that has a really strong core competency in one area, for example, your real estate company could do the lead gen for other companies because you do that so well. Like you could plug other companies and, and, and no one would ever know but you would just say, hey, look, here's how we do it. I, I could do it for me. I can do it for you. You could, you could actually do that as a scalable part of your business because Chantel Ray Real Estate is so proficient at, um, and so dialed in in lead gen, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you, you could typically, you could hybrid your business whenever you have a particular area, be it front of the house, whether it be fulfillment, whether it's marketing, whether it's back of the house, filing, bookkeeping, finance. Um, we, have a, we have a client that's a trucking company that is so, so adept financially that they, have, they now will finance the loads of other brokers because they have such good banking and finance relationships. So they've scaled that part of their business as well. Yeah, that's what we've thought about. Our, what we do really well is 
we have a back end system that all we'd have to do is kind of unbrand it to ourselves. But it yeah. has, you know, it's a technology system that has anything that a someone who's wanting real owns a real estate company would need. Yeah. They could change. They could change all of our, uh, you know, HR manuals, all of the other things. They could take it. We could rebrand it to them. All the systems they need, we've developed. They could put do that. And then also, like you said, we could do our call center. We could generate leads all over the country and we could do something like powered by Chantal Ray, or we could just send those lead, those referrals over at a 35% referral. So yeah. we've one, kind one of, of the, through yeah. a bunch of those different ideas of what we could do to kind of take it to the next level. Yeah, so for sure. What are some big mistakes that you've seen, like the lessons you've learned and any companies that you could say, this company tried to do it, they failed miserably so that we don't have to use those same mistakes. Right, yeah, yeah. So the, um, you, when, you're, when you're a growth company um, and, you, and you're going to scale, you have to, there, there's, there's a period, um, and that's why we call it a transition period, and the miracle 1%, but there's a period where your energy that was once directed at your clientele 100% has to go internal for a period of time. So you, <clears throat> excuse me, so you can fully commit to the internal systems. And there comes a point um, when your team has outperformed the design of the systems, meaning you taught them how to answer a phone call or how to you know, send a post, send a post or design an ad and they're getting better results than you thought, and they're actually running those systems well. What I, it, this often happens to the founder, they call it the founder's trap. The founder cannot let go. I was just, what, I was just reading a, uh, an interview, an old interview with Bill Gates, where he said in the early days of Microsoft, he, he wrote all the code, and then when they bought in coders, he had to sign off on all the code before it went out. And then they brought in um, uh, Steve Ballmer, and Steve was like, Bill, this ain't happening. Nah, that's it. Nah, you're not doing that anymore. And, but Bill Gates had a hard time letting go of the coding because that was his area of competency, right? And so it's usually the, the main problem tends to be the founder because we got off the ground and we proved our concept based on the founder's drive, but now we've got to, um, uh, we've got to let go of that and let the next generation take over. This is very, very common in family-run businesses where the where the parent won't let go and so a family can't scale and, and have it grow beyond uh, have it grow beyond um, what the founder first um, uh, envisioned. And they hold on to the point where the family members scatter and they start all of their own. The largest home builder in the United States is a company called Havnanian. If you look real close, it says Havnanian, and on some developments, it says K Havnanian. Well, guess who K Havnanian is? The brother, because they couldn't get along. They didn't work it out. Family held on too tight. And so now Havnanian is the largest, and K Havnanian is a, is a substantial company as well. But they are two different companies because of the same dynamic I'm talking about. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Well, this is amazing. Carl, tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. So um, uh, go to carlgould.com. Um, and uh, I'd like to offer to all of our listeners, we give a, a free business analysis, a growth analysis of your business. So if you go to carlgould.com and go, you know, contact us or contact and just put business analysis in the subject line, and we'll make sure that one of, your, one of our growth advisors follows up with you and, and shows you five ways how to grow your business. Love it. Well, this has been awesome. And you guys stay tuned because we have another amazing episode coming up in just a minute. Stay with us. Bye-bye for now.